Welcome back to Computer Science Theory. This is COMS W3261, offered Summer B 2021 at Columbia University. And this is Lecture 11, our final lecture, Part 1. So Lecture 11 will be on reductions. So that is showing that if one problem is easy, another problem is easy or if one problem is hard, then another problem is hard. And time complexity. So, so far in this course, we've talked almost completely about computability. Can we recognize a language? But we haven't worried about how much time it takes or how much memory it takes. So in this last lecture, we're gonna take a very quick sort of snapshot overview of that. We'll talk about what it means to be efficient when you're using time and space. And hopefully that'll pique your interest and you'll go take the Columbia class on complexity theory, which is very interesting. Uh, let's see. Announcements for today. Uh, we have homework number six. Our last homework is due Monday. Eight, nine at 11.59 p.m. And just because it's, people might be wondering, um, as usual, we'll accept it late through 11.59 p.m. on Friday. So you can turn it in through 11.59 p.m. on Friday. Past that, uh, we'll have a harder time doing extensions just because we've reached the end of the course. There is also a final exam coming up on Tuesday and Wednesday. So this will be available from 12.01 a.m. EST on, I think, 8.10 through 11.59 p.m. on 8.11. And you can use any 12 hours in that 48 hour range to take this exam. So when you're ready to take it, go on to Gradescope, download it, treat it like a regular assignment, uh, do the assignment, and then um, upload it again 12 hours later. Uh, all the details about the final exam are on Ed and on Courseworks. So you can go check those posts for specific information. We'll also have a review session for the final. So I'll be hosting actually two review sessions, one from 1 to 4 p.m. on Monday. And that is in person in the CS Lounge. And one from 5 to 8 p.m., which will be virtual, all times Eastern time. So come hang out. We'll do office hours. We'll do part review session. We'll chat about the final. Uh, it'll be a fun time. Those are the announcements for today. The readings that correspond to this lecture. Uh, 5.1 is undecidability and reductions. And then 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3 uh, these parts of the textbook talk about big O and big omega notation. Uh, they also talk about time complexity. And they introduce the time complexity classes P and NP. So we'll be going through this stuff relatively briefly. And I'll tell you up front that if we see questions on time complexity on the final, there'll be extra credit questions. So formally, like things that you are absolutely responsible for knowing through the final is up through 5.1, undecidability and reductions. Uh, roadmap, let's see. 
what will we chat about today and in what order? We'll start with review as always. So a bunch of things that we proved decidable and undecidable last lecture. We'll do some reductions and more examples of undecidable languages. Then we will review big O notation and introduce the idea of time complexity. We'll talk about two more classes of language languages. So these are just big sets containing some languages. So we've seen lots of language classes before, like the regular languages, the context-free languages, the Turing decidable and Turing recognizable languages. These are just like that, except instead of being defined in terms of what particular computational models can recognize, they'll be defined in terms of what particular computational models can recognize within a certain time limit. And then we'll do a quick wrap up. We'll summarize what we did in the course. So what did we talk about last week? Well, we showed that a bunch of languages were decidable. So we started, I think this is our teaser question. We showed that the language ADFA was decidable. So this is one of our first examples of a language where strings in the language encoded an automaton. So some string in the language, it'll be a string, but the string will encode both a DFA and an input string for that DFA. And we showed this language was recognizable by, or decidable, by showing a Turing machine could just read in A, if A was a correctly formatted DFA, we could just simulate A on W. And that process would always terminate because DFA is always terminate on finite inputs. Uh, similarly, we showed through related proofs that these other analogous languages, A and FA, A regular expression, A CFG, were all decidable. So each of these languages takes in an NFA, a regular expression, a context-free grammar, and a string and asks us, uh, is this string recognizable or generable from this particular computational object? We saw a couple other types of decidable languages. So we had this language EDFA. And EDFA doesn't take in, um, takes in automaton, but it doesn't take in an encoded string. It just says, here's some encoded DFA. And the language of this DFA is the empty set. In other words, this DFA never accepts. We showed we could recognize this by uh, picking apart this DFA with our Turing machine, looking at the states, and realizing there was no way to get to an accept state. We use the decidability of EDFA to prove the decidability of this other language, EQDFA. There's also a question about automata and the languages they recognize. In particular, EQDFA, which you could think of as standing for equal, takes in two DFAs, A and B, and accepts if the language of A is equal to the language of B. So when we thought about this, our first idea was, well, let's just try all the strings and make sure they always do the same thing. But that process doesn't terminate. There's an infinite number of input strings. And we want to decide. We want to come to a conclusive answer and stop always. So instead, we use this tricky roundabout route where we built a new language. We said, 
this new language is empty, is the empty language if and only if A equals B. And then we used our decider for EDFA to solve the problem. So that's actually an early example of a reduction. We reduced our problem of solving EQDFA to a problem we already knew how to solve. Uh, we saw, we updated our picture of the universe. So we had these context-free languages, which are all the languages described by a CFG or recognized by a PDA. And we showed conclusively that the context-free languages were a subset of the decidable languages. By definition, the decidable languages are a subset of the Turing recognizable languages. So we completed our universe and knowing that Turing recognizable was the biggest class led us to ask, okay, what is there that's not even recognizable? Is there anything? It's hard to imagine. Are there things that aren't decidable but are recognizable? We answered both questions in the affirmative by looking at this language ATM. So we had some new vocabulary. We said a set is countable if it admits a one to one mapping to the natural numbers. Um, the definition countable is hopefully an easy one to remember, because if you can be mapped one to one to the natural numbers, which we'll think of as just one, two, three, and so on, well, then you can count your set. For instance, we said the set of TMs is countable. That meant you could define some ordering over the set of TMs such that you could say, this is TM number one, this is Turing machine number two, this is Turing machine number three, and every Turing machine appears in my ordering somewhere. But we also observed that the set of infinite binary strings, so only the ones that go on forever, not the finite ones, is uncountable. We use this to show via a one-to-one -one mapping that the set of languages over any given alphabet is uncountable. And because the set of languages was uncountable, but the set of Turing machines is countable, that meant we could rule out a one-to-one -one mapping between them, right? If we could map the set of languages to the set of Turing machines, then we could also map them to the natural numbers and we'd have that the set of languages was countable. That's a contradiction. So we were able to conclude because there's no one-to-one -one mapping between languages and Turing machines, some language or some languages must not be Turing recognizable. Because of course, uh, if we map every Turing machine to the language it recognizes, that's a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, or it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. If it were, that would contradict what we know. So we know that some languages must be missed in that mapping. Some of them must not be Turing recognizable. That was a cool, cool existence proof by diagonalization. We showed that this region outside of recognizability must be populated, but this result didn't actually tell us what kind of languages might live there. It just showed that some of them must exist. However, we pretty quickly went on to show some inhabitants of these far regions. We introduced the language ATM. So by analogy to ADFA, this takes in a Turing machine encoded on the tape and some input string such that A accepts W. And we observed that ATM is recognizable. And the reason we know ATM is recognizable is we just simulate A on W. 
will accept if A accepts. That's guaranteed to work for any accepting string and not to accept any not accepting string. However, if W is not accepted by A, our simulation might loop, might go on forever. Specifically, if A loops on W, then our simulation of A will loop on W. So ATM is recognizable, but it's not decidable. So in particular, it lives out here in this recognizable, not decidable bubble. And we showed this by saying, if ATM were decidable, we could create a paradox machine. This is a machine that exhibits behavior that is implicitly paradoxical. Paradoxical. This machine cannot exist, so ATM must not be decidable. Uh, and this actually quick, pretty quickly gave us an even more difficult language, the complement of ATM. So that is all strings that do not encode a Turing machine in a string, such that the Turing machine accepts the string. And we concluded a, the complement of ATM is unrecognizable. And we concluded this because if ATM and its complement were both recognizable, then ATM would be decidable. So ATM is not decidable. So this is out of bounds. This is a contradiction. The reason this implication holds, we observe that if you could recognize all the strings in a language, and you could also recognize when a string wasn't in the language, you could run your two recognizers in parallel, that is, simulate them, jumping back and forth between your simulations. And on any string, you'd be guaranteed to halt. You'd either eventually get the recognizer for ATM to halt, in which case the string is in the language, or the recognizer for complement of ATM to halt, in which case it wasn't in the language. So that setup would give us a decider for ATM, which we know cannot exist. So we know complement of ATM is out here. But as of yet, these are our only examples of undecidable and unrecognizable languages. We want more especially because, um, well, they're relatively natural languages, but we want more examples so we can kind of see what properties make a language undecidable, what properties make it unrecognizable. And we'll do that by laziness. So if you recall, way back when, we wanted to prove lots of languages were regular. We got fed up with building DFAs for every single language we wanted to prove was regular. So we showed closure under union and concatenation in star. Then we just use that tool to generate a ton more languages that were recognizable. We'll do a similar thing here. In particular, we'll talk about reductions and more undecidable languages. So a reduction, they often look complicated in practice, but the idea behind them is really pretty simple. The idea is just in computer science, we are lazy. We build up solutions to hard problems using subroutines. If you're writing a program, you don't write it in machine code. You write it in some language that's built up on top of machine code. You probably don't even write it from scratch in that language. You probably use a library of functions that someone else has built for you. Um, and if you're a good programmer, you will reuse the heck out of all the functions you can get your hands on. You'll use other people's code and you will make your life very easy and simple at the high level. I mean, 
maybe you're interested in really, really fast runtime, in which case you break things down again. But often, we like to be lazy. We build up solutions to hard problems using subroutines. So the logic looks like this. We prove I can do A if I can do B. And we prove I can do B. And we get I can do A as a consequence. So if we're struggling to do A, it can be helpful to reduce A to some easier problem B by proving a statement like, if I can do B, I can do A. So we'll say B or A reduces to B. So we'll say A reduces to B if solving B lets us solve A. This is one way we can use this logic. We can also use it to prove that problems are hard. So in particular, we can also use this other type of logic. We can say, we wanna prove, we can prove, A is hard. And then we prove if I could solve B, I could solve A. By hard here will often mean undecidable or unrecognizable or something like that. And if we can prove this second statement, we get this nice result that B must be hard. Because if B wasn't hard, well, then we could solve A. But we know we can't solve A. So not only can you use this logic to prove that some problems are easy, if other problems are easy, you can also use it backwards to show that some problems are hard if other problems are hard. And that's mainly what we're going to be focusing on today. We're going to be focusing on the second architecture of reduction. In particular, we'll use our two canonical undecidable and unrecognizable problems to show that other languages are hard. So let's do an example. And this is an example of a very commonly cited hard problem called the halting problem. In particular, we're about to prove that no debugger can tell you in general that your program has an infinite loop. Might be able to tell you in specific cases, but there cannot be a debugger that looks at any program and tells you if it stops. And we'll do that by showing that this problem is effectively undecidable. So here's our theorem. We've got this language that we'll call halt sub Turing machine. And it'll be the language of all pairs MW, such that M is a Turing machine and M halts on W. So not super hard, looks kind of like ATM. We'll show that this is undecidable. And then proof will be by reduction from ATM. In other words, we'll show that if we could solve HALT, then we could solve ATM. We can't solve ATM, so therefore we must not be able to solve HALT. It's also essentially by contradiction is the underlying method. So 
we show that if alt tm were decidable, ATM would be decidable. And how we'll do this, we just need to prove this conditional statement. So we'll assume some TMR decides halt. So this is just some imaginary Turing machine that will tell us, uh, we'll always stop and accept if the input is a Turing machine that halts on W. We'll always stop and reject if we get MW such that M does not halt on W. Given R, we can build a decider for ATM as follows. So our Turing machine will take input MW. It'll check to make sure that the input is coded, encoded correctly. And it'll do the following. It'll use R, our decider for halt TM, as a checker. So we'll run R on MW. If R rejects, and if R rejects, that means what? M doesn't halt on W. So M certainly doesn't accept W. So if R rejects, we reject. But if R accepts, now we know that M stops on W, right? R is our halting checker. So M doesn't stop on W, we know to stop and reject because we've run this decider that we know will terminate. If not, M does stop on W. So then we're empowered to simulate M on W and accept, reject. I should call it, really call this machine M1. So it's distinct from my input. There we go, M1, now it's a new thing. M1 will simulate M on W and accept or reject if M accepts or rejects. And the reason we couldn't just build M1 before, the reason we couldn't just build a simulator for M on W, uh, the reason that ATM is not decidable effectively is that this is not guaranteed to halt normally. But if we have a checker that checks haltingness, we have a machine R that decides the halting problem, we can use R to build a machine that decides ATM. Um, this contradicts the undecidability of ATM. So Alt-TM must be undecidable. Just to pump your intuition, some questions that we should be able to answer pretty easily are questions like, is halt TM recognizable? The answer is yes. Here we can just simulate. We simulate M on W. If it stops, we accept. If it doesn't stop, well, we're under no obligation to do anything. Our simulation can run forever because all we're doing is recognizing uh, inputs M and W such that M stops on W.
Another question we could ask is, is Halt TM co-recognizable? Or equivalently, is its complement recognizable? And here we can say no. If so, this would imply decidability. So this goes back to our theorem that said, if we can recognize a language and its complement, then we can decide the language by simulating both of these in parallel. So the moral of this section, no infinite loop detectors. So the next time you write a program in Python and it compiles and there's an infinite loop and it runs forever and it crashes your computer, you have to kill the process. You can take small consolation in knowing this is not the fault of the Python developers. It's impossible for them to write a compiler that checks your code for infinite loops because the halting problem is undecidable. And because uh, what Turing machines can do is precisely what the metal box on your desk can do. Let's do a couple more quick examples of reductions for undecidability. So we'll get a couple more languages in this class of things that are undecidable. And we'll come to a general, general conclusion about a lot of languages that are undecidable. So example two, well, we've shown ATM is undecidable. What about ETM? So this is language of encoded Turing machines that don't accept any strings. And we'll do our proof in the same way. Proof by reduction. So we'll say if ETM decidable, then ATM is decidable. Which of course is a contradiction because ATM is not decidable. So we'll say, suppose ETM is decided by some TM S. The following TM would decide ATM. So T is gonna be a decider for ATM. So as input, it'll take some Turing machine M and a string W. We wanna use ETM somehow. So what we'll do is we'll actually build another machine that'll help us out as part of our subroutine. Uh, there's no reason our Turing machines can't construct and simulate other Turing machines, as long as those are fully specified. So what we'll do is we will we'll use the encoding of M to build a new TM, M prime, that rejects all strings that are not equal to W. That's pretty easy, right? We just need a Turing machine that looks at the input string, and if it's not W, it goes to the reject state immediately. And on W simulates MW and accepts, rejects if MW accepts. <laughs> 
projects. So the key thing here is we're building a new turning machine, M prime. We're not actually running it. So I'm taking in some input, an encoded Turing machine M, and I'm building on my tape a new Turing machine M prime. I'm not running M prime, I'm just building M prime. And I'm claiming that I can build it such that it rejects every string that's not W and simulates M on W. <sighs> Excuse me. So why is this handy? Well, now we can simulate our machine S on the encoding of M prime. If M prime is in ETM, that is, if M prime does not accept any strings, well, we know it doesn't accept any strings that aren't W, so M prime doesn't accept any strings at all, if and only if MW doesn't accept. So we'll reject because this tells us that M does not accept on W. If M prime is not an ETM, we accept. So let's go through the logic here because it may not be immediately obvious why this Turing machine always halts. Why does this work? Well, let's look at the two cases. Let's say, say M W accepts. Then the language of M prime, well, the language of M prime, it's always gonna reject every string that's not W, but on W, it'll simulate M W and it'll accept because M W accepts. If MW does not accept, then the language of M prime is the empty language because it'll reject all strings that are not W. On W, it'll simulate MW, but it'll either loop forever or reject. So it doesn't accept W either. So in this first case, we have that the encoding of M prime is not in ETM. And in the second case, we have the encoding of M prime is in ETM. So this tells us that our final step is at least logically doing the right thing. If M prime is, I should say, if the encoding of M prime is in the language ETM, well, then we will reject. right? Because this happens precisely when M does not accept W and vice versa. If M prime is not an ETM, we'll accept. But how do we know this will always stop? The key here is very cool. We're never actually running M prime. All right. We're running S. We run S which is a decider, which always stops. We build M prime, which is a finite process because M prime is a finite object. Um, now M prime on W might run forever, but we never actually run M prime. We run a different machine, a decider on its description. That's how we're getting around um, the infinity here. And that's why this checker for whether a Turing machine is in ETM can help us solve ATM. So that completes this proof. If we can decide ETM, then we can decide ATM. ATM is not decidable, however. So this is a contradiction. And ETM is also undecidable. We'll do one more example.
And this will be our example of a reduction that's not to ATM. It's a reduction to ETM. So by analogy to other languages we've seen previously, we can define this language EQTM that takes in two encoded Turing machines and accepts if they accept the same language. So we'll show that the language that tests equality for Turing machines is undecidable. The proof is by reduction from ETM. So we'll show that if EQTM were decidable, ETM would be decidable. And of course, that's a contradiction because we've just shown ETM is undecidable. Let's assume EQTM is decided by some Turing machine R. Then the following Turing machine will decide ETM. So a uh, Turing machine that'll decide ETM will take in one machine, and we need to figure out whether or not this machine rejects all strings, whether or not the language of this machine is the empty language. And I claim it's pretty easy to do if we could decide EQTM. We'll just run R on M, M1, where M1 is some TM that rejects all inputs. So now we know that the language of M is equal to the language of M1 if and only if the language of M is the empty language. So now we can just accept or reject if R accepts or rejects. In other words, deciding equality between two TMs is a harder problem than deciding if some Turing machine only accepts the empty string. And because ETM, deciding that language is hard, well, therefore, um, Therefore, EQTM cannot be decided. If it were, we could also decide ETM, which we know can't be decided. That's our last reduction example. And at this point, you might be tempted to say, all right, well, ATM is undecidable. EQTM is undecidable. ETM is undecidable. Are all the properties of Turing machines undecidable? Like, is it always hard to figure out what a Turing machine does? And Surprisingly, the answer is yes. Um, I'm not going to prove this theorem today, but it's an interesting theorem. It's worth looking up. Um, and it is a good takeaway punchline to our chat about undecidability. So this is a theorem called the Rice's theorem. And it says effectively that all non-trivial properties of Turing machines are hard to decide. They're just really hard things for other Turing machines to take apart. So self-referential problems, well, not exactly self-referential problems, problems about other programs tend to be hard problems. So Rice's theorem formally goes as follows. It says, let P be 
some language of Turing machine descriptions. That is, for example, an input like M that satisfies two properties such that one is P contains some, but not all, TM descriptions. non-trivial. So in particular, if P contains no TM descriptions, well, then it's just the empty language. And if it contains all TM descriptions, well, then the problem is just, does this input describe a Turing machine? So we want to make P a little bit harder than that. So we'll say P is some Turing machines, but not all Turing machines. And two is that P captures some property, very general, of the language recognized by the input TM. So what this means is um, P has to be some language that recognizes Turing machines that have languages with a certain property, but not Turing machines that have languages without that property. In particular, if two Turing machines recognize the same language, they should also have the same property P because the property is a property of the language. So what this really means is if the language of M1 is the exact same as the language of M2, even if these two are different machines, then we want the description of M1 to be in this language, if and only if the description of M2 is in this language. So effectively, what P is doing is it's capturing some non-trivial property of languages recognized by Turing machines. Then P is undecidable. So this is just a formal way of saying that all non-trivial properties of Turing machines are undecidable. Generally, if you're looking at a language and the language says, take in a Turing machine as input and accept or reject, if the language of this Turing machine has some property, all of those things are undecidable. And this applies to ATM, to ETM, to EQTM, and to many, many other uh, properties. And so that's a large class now of undecidable languages to which we can refer if we want to. I won't prove this theorem, but this does give us an idea of what might make a language undecidable, one thing that might make the language undecidable. So that'll do us for part one. In the final section, we'll talk about time complexity. That is talking about how long it takes turning machines to solve problems, not just can they solve them in the abstract. So I'll see you in that one. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.